There's a saying in Thailand that if you haven't suffered, you usually don't go to a monastery or you don't go to stay. This is one thing we all have in common. We're here because we see that ordinary pleasures are not enough. We've all suffered in one way or another, and we decide we want, we've had enough of that. We want to get past our suffering. Some people have a certain pain in their lives, and when that particular pain gets assuaged and they stop practicing. Other people see that the suffering is built into the way we live, the way we function. So the problem goes deeper than that. Those are the ones who stick around. An important part of learning how to put an end to suffering is comprehending it. As the Buddha said, this is the duty with regard to the First Noble Truth. You look at the way he defines the Noble Truth, you realize the issue is not in learning the words, because he doesn't really define suffering. He just gives some examples. He throws it back on you. Where is your suffering right now? And then at the very end he says, so every suffering or every form of suffering has something in common with all other forms. It's five clinging aggregates. Form clinging aggregate, feeling clinging aggregate, perception clinging aggregate, fabrications clinging aggregate, consciousness clinging aggregate. And people have often asked, where did the Buddha get this analysis? Because you don't see it in any pre-Buddhist teachings. He mentions it in his first discourse, explains a little bit more in his second. And the people who were listening gained awakening. So what was he referring to? Once had someone asked me, well, suppose you're looking at a tree. Explain the aggregates involved in the process of looking at a tree. That's a very Western kind of question. I think of philosophy as describing what happens when you look at something. In Indian thought, the basic action that they were always trying to explain was eating. And I think this is one of the best ways of getting to know the aggregates, just seeing how the aggregates function in, eat in eating, because it's a very integral part of this experience that we all have. We're hungry, we look for food. We've got a body that, that's form right there, and the feeling of hunger, that's the feeling aggregate. So we go looking around. That's fabrication. We find something that looks good. Again, the feeling aggregate. But we remember we've seen things in the past that looked good. So we have to run this past the other things we've eaten in the past. To see what it lines up with. This is the function of perception, the labels you have in mind, the things that you recognize. You come across a red mushroom, it looks good, but you remember red mushrooms are deadly. So you put them aside. Then you, cross, you come across other things that may not look so good, but you remember that this is good food. There's that cartoon, Calvin and Hobbes, where Calvin said, so who was that first person who squeezed something out of a cow's udder and said, boy, I want to eat that? But this is what we grew up on. So the purpose of, or the use of perception is to remind us that you can't always trust your first glance. You have to remember what's edible and what's not. Then, of course, there's the question, once you've found something that's edible, what do you do with it? There are a lot of things that require a lot of preparation. 
the Thai translation for fabrication fits in right here, brung dang. This is what you do with food. You brung dang it. You fix it up. That's what fabrication is all about, how you put things together, the activities that you engage in in order to make something edible. Consciousness, consciousness of course, underlies all these things. You're aware of the form, of the feeling, of the perception, of the fabrication. So this is probably the best way to get a handle on those aggregates. These are the activities you engage in as you go around looking for food. This, of course, relates directly to the clinging part of the aggregates. The clinging also means the act of feeding. You're feeding off these activities. The body feeds off the food, but the mind gains pleasure off of these, out of these activities because it's found this is how you survive. This is how you take in parts of the world and make them part of yourself. That's what eating is all about, this taking the not-self and making it self. And the mind gets pleasure out of the feeling and the perception and get the fabrication, the whole thing. You can sit here and fantasize about the food that you're going to fix tomorrow, or you can fantasize about the food you're going to eat tomorrow. It's all part of the same fabrication process. And even before we put the food in our mouths, we've fed off of the anticipation. And there's an enjoyment that goes into actually fixing the food. But of course, you realize it's not always an enjoyable process. Sometimes you can't find the food that you want. Or you come at the end of the day and you're really, really tired and you've got to fix a meal. And there's no fun in fixing that kind of meal. And yet we keep coming back to these processes because we need them in order to eat. This is why so much of the meditation goes against the grain, because the Buddha is asking us to reverse the process, stop feeding off of these things, both the actual physical food and the enjoyment we get out of the processes around the act of eating. Instead of taking something that's not self and making it self, he's having us look at these things that we've assumed to be self and reverse the process, realize that it's not self. Not just the physical food you take in, but also the activities themselves. But you can't jump straight from one side of the equation to the other. This is why we practice meditation, because as you get the mind concentrated, you're learning how to use these aggregates in it somewhat different way. You make them a path. And in the process of bringing the mind into concentration, you're going to be dealing with these same aggregates. The form of the body, which is the breath, the feelings of pleasure and pain that you find in the breath, the perception of breath, which you find that as you manipulate it, you experience the breath in different ways. And then, of course, there's the fabrication. If the breath doesn't feel good, what are you going to do to make it feel better? Same way if you don't like raw eggs, what are you going to do to cook them? And then there's the consciousness of all these things. This is your food on the path. The Buddha makes that analogy very clear in that image of the fortress. Discernment is the plaster-covered wall of the fortress, covered with plaster so that the enemy can't get any footholds or handholds on the wall. Mindfulness is the gatekeeper who remembers, using perception, who's friendly and who's not, i.e., what activities are skillful and which ones are not. So you let in the friendly people and you keep out the unfriendly ones, the enemies. You act on your skillful intentions and you remember not to, and you're mindful not to act on the unskillful ones. The soldiers inside are your right effort 
than the food for the soldiers and for the gatekeeper. Those are the various states of jhana. You gain a sense of well-being as you, as you fix the mind, in the same way that you would fix food. You can feed off that sense of rapture and pleasure. It gives you a lot of energy. So the Buddha doesn't have you starve. He just teaches you a new way to eat. The difference here being that as you feed on the path, develop the qualities of conviction, persistence, mindfulness, concentration, and discernment, these become strengths. Not ultimately, they get so strong that they bring the mind to a point where it doesn't need to feed anymore. This is the part of the practice that really lies outside of our normal experience. Everything we experience is a kind of feeding up to this point. But to think of the mind that doesn't need to feed, that's something that really stretches the imagination. And so it's important that we learn how to keep our <coughs> imagination stretched in that way. There is a possibility of a happiness that doesn't have to feed on anything at all, doesn't have to ingest anything, doesn't have to fix anything up. That's what we're aiming for. So you may find it helpful to think of the aggregates in this way. These are the activities that go around feeding in all its various forms. These are the things that we're going to have to learn how to let go of. But you can do it only by comprehending them both by getting very familiar with how you go around feeding on pleasure in the normal way, and learning how to train yourself to feed on pleasure in terms of right concentration. There's a passage in the Dhammapada where they say that the arahants have comprehended food. And this is what it means. You've comprehended the aggregates. You've comprehended the act of feeding. And when you get to the point where you don't need to do that anymore, then they say, your path cannot be traced. Some people like to think about nirvana as a total wiping out of any kind of consciousness or anything. But if that were the case, the Buddha wouldn't have described it in the way he does. It's a, tra a path that cannot be traced. If it were a wipeout, it would be very easy to describe. So it's good to get your imagination stretched a little bit. And to realize that going beyond this process of feeding, which has been our source of pleasure for who knows how long, but it's also been our source of pain. It's been, as I said, the Buddhist definition of suffering. You have to comprehend it. And ultimately, the only way you're going to comprehend it is to go beyond it. And this is the only path that will take you there. <laughs>